Well, thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, my name's Adrian Romano, and I work in school and teacher programs at the Michener Art Museum in the Public Engagement Department. I'm here with three of my awesome colleagues from the department, um, and they will be introducing themselves later on in the as we go through the presentation this evening. And we're just really excited to be sharing all of our experiences of Zooming, Zooming, Zooming virtually for 2020. Um, so what we plan to do this evening is share with you what we've learned, what challenges we faced, what kinds of programs we offered um, during the year and also earlier already in 2021. Um, and also as many of us experienced in the, um, we all jumped into the virtual world kicking and screaming um, and not maybe not knowing much, but we've come away with a lot, a lot of uh, things we've learned. So, and I think we continue to learn as we move on. Um, and as Allison said, we'll have question, uh, we'll have a conversation at the end of the formal presentation. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say, your feedback and, and anything, any questions you have for us. Um, also, um, if you wouldn't mind um, indicating in the chat where you're all from, um, if you could just say your, you know, your name, your title, your organization, that would also help us as we go through the program this evening. So thanks, all right. So I just wanted to take a brief moment, um, if you're not familiar with the Missioner Art Museum, um, just to give you a little bit of background about who we are, um, if you haven't been to us. Um, we're an American art museum located in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. We're about an hour by car from Philadelphia. Uh, we're focused on preserving and collecting and exhibiting art by um, nationally and internationally known artists from the Delaware Valley region by many creative disciplines. So we also provide a series of changing exhibitions throughout the year in varying media and artistic expressions. And our former site actually was the Bucks County Prison for close to 100 years from 1884 to 1985. The museum has been open since 1988, and our namesake is James A. Mishner, the famous Pulitzer Prize winning author. Um, he was made famous by his book, Tales of the South Pacific, which was then turned into a Broadway play, uh, South Pacific, so you might be familiar with his work. But he was also a very um, lover of the arts. He was an art collector, um, and so he was also a Doylestown native, so that's where we get our, our namesake for, our, for the Mishner Art Museum. Um, we're also, well, we can also say that the Michener off is the only place that offers art classes in Bucks County where learners of all ages can experience the museum exhibitions integral to their learning as part of their arts education experience. So uh, students are exposed to um, the real works of art as they experience the art classes. So. And to give you some background about our audience too, um, you know, pre-COVID we were serving about 100,000 to 120,000 visitors a year. Um, naturally, like many museums and our closures, we, we definitely had a very big drop in attendance for 2020. Um, we did open in late July of 2020 at limited capacity and reduced hours. And then we also did close like other museums did in, in the late winter months. Um, about one third of museum visitors um, come from beyond Bucks County um, and the Philadelphia region. So it's another statistic. And usually our education department services about 25,000 visitors in person under normal years. So uh, some bit, some statistics about, you'll be hearing from my colleagues about some more details about the audiences they served um, during the pandemic. Um, but overall, these are our statistics for 2020. We did about 97 virtual programs for 2020, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, we served uh, 2,900 uh, folks uh, with these programs, with these live synchronous programs via Zoom. Um, just for comparison's sake, I did mention that 25,000 people normally in person in our education programs is what we serve. But for this purpose tonight, we also wanted to say that our virtual programs did combine both synchronous and asynchronous content. So we provided a lot of live programming, but then we also developed some digital content, some asynchronous content, and also these programs were both 
free and paid and we'll we'll be getting into more details as we as we go through the program this this evening and some of the programs that were developed were entirely new on the virtual programs some were programs that were traditionally in person and were translated onto the virtual platform so you'll hear a little bit about that as well this evening all right so in the beginning of the pandemic, we realized much like other museums that um, we, we also wanted to acknowledge the, the, what we were doing too, as far as our digital content. Um, we recognized that we had a lot of digital content that we could share with our audiences and not necessarily reinvent the wheel. Um, so this was definitely part of our, our virtual efforts uh, during, during the year. Uh, we knew we wanted to keep our audiences engaged um, especially during the closure. Um, and so we started really working in earnest um, with our marketing team. Um, we started internally meeting on a weekly basis, I think. Um, and we knew the importance of really starting to push out our digital content. Um, and this was via a lot of different platforms. Um, we have uh, microsites. Uh, we have an education website called Learn with the Michener. We also have a Bucks County Artist Database. We have mobile apps um, and audio tours. We also have um, high resolution imagery on the Google Arts and Culture platform. So we, we really started to think about what kind of content we could get out there. We also developed brand new content for our YouTube platform um, and uh, that you'll hear about, you'll hear a little bit about as well. We also really, uh, social media was a big push. Um, there was some new content that was developed on social media called Missioner Staff in Conversation, which um, also volunteers and docents participated in as well, where videos were done of, of staff sharing their favorite um, works from the Missioner Art Museum's collection. So there's a lot of, lot of um, work that we did around our digital content. One of the, um, as we learned more about the needs in the virtual learning environments and knowing that students in remote learning contexts needed an asynchronous um, form of content, um, we developed um, one of these, this series called Art Talks for Kids and Teens. And the goal in mind was to share this new content with teachers so that they may engage their students in learning in the arts. Um, we also knew that we have a really amazing group of docents at the Mishner, and they were really interested in staying involved and supporting the institution. And we really wanted to collaborate and find a way to continue to work with our docents, to continue to engage with them, as well as help keep our community engaged with the institution. Um, so this was one one way where we started to collaborate with docents on the virtual platform and provide um, this um, casual um, discussion based uh, video program that we have offered on our YouTube channel. And the art talks are generally around 15 to 20 minutes. We like to, we, we learned a lot in developing the program. Um, we uh, wanted to keep it conversational, less scripted. Um, we also um, share it in tandem with our education site. So we try to accompany um, educational activities with this video program. Um, challenging was actually getting the docents used to using Zoom and, and, and recording themselves and, and being, you know, being recorded and it's it was an entirely new process for everybody but and encouraging them not to read off scripts and and to really get into it and I think it's really worked well and um, some of our docents have really enjoyed participating. Um, so another area that um, we offered some virtual programs was um, in the area that I work in, which is the school and teacher area. Um, we, we didn't have a huge amount of activity this, uh, this past year with schools, but um, we did continue to provide programmatic activity for, uh, for kids. Um, and it was fee-based. We did develop a fee around it, but for Title I schools, we offer uh, virtual programs at no cost, thanks to an endowment that we have at the Missioner. Um, we continue to promote our digital content to teachers on our education site and so forth. 
And the one thing that, um, and perhaps some of my colleagues will be talking about too, is that we did query our audiences um, early on in the pandemic as to what platforms they were using in virtual learning and what kinds of content would be useful and interesting uh, for, for our visitors. So we did develop an online survey. We also developed um, online surveys for our school and teacher audiences as well. Um, we did develop some, progr some programs that usually take place in person, like our educators' open houses for teachers. We translated that into the, into the virtual uh, format, which seemed to work fine, um, but we're, we're certainly looking forward to doing that uh, program in person. And that's usually a biannual free program for teachers to come visit the museum. All right. So I think, I think that's, I'm going to share um, the next slide. I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, Andrea Thompson, Arts Education Manager. So thank you. There we go. Hi everyone, Adrienne, thank you. Um, like Adrienne said, my name is Andrea Thompson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Arts Education Manager at the Mitchell Art Museum, which basically means I oversee all of the art making, that typically happens inside our walls at the museum. And we don't have smart boards in our classrooms. We have one projector. We really were not using technology almost at all. Uh, we don't have a computer lab or anything that uh, I think K through 12 settings might have in the art classroom. And so when we went home, we went home with almost nothing. Uh, I think I grabbed some of my children's books off my shelf, but really wasn't prepared to do a lot of teaching online. And um, we worked with our marketing department and we quickly, uh, I think our first video I recorded March 29th for this free series on our YouTube, Michener Made Mondays. And so I was shooting and making, editing these videos with our social media manager, um, where I would focus on a different work from our permanent collection. And then I was making, you can see here with things that I had at home and that I was hoping people would also have at home. I wasn't bringing crazy patterned paper. I was suggesting to people to use things like wrapping paper, uh, scissors, glue sticks, but nothing because they, you really couldn't go out to the stores right at the start. And uh, we, as you can see, I'm using, I think this is like a subscription recipe box that I've pulled apart. There's a sparkling water box that I'm using to create this relief. And this is shot on my dining room table. Most of my backgrounds look like this. <laughs> and um, I, we're still figuring out, I this is a travel easel that I had for college that I rubber banded my phone to. So I think we'll we'll talk a little bit more later about we really didn't have a ton of technology to work with. Um, I I don't think I I don't have an iPad. We were really just shooting things with our phones, and uh, I think every light from my living room, <laughs> and and we improved later on. But that's really um, where we started. And Adrian, if you can go to the next slide. And uh, we went from having about 16 classes during a regular school week uh, and 45 summer camps to these numbers here. But I think we're still really proud of what we were able to accomplish. And I won't read the entire list off to you, uh, but we were able to do virtual summer camps. We had about one a week. And the museum was closed to the public. So we were packing art kits. Uh, I say we, I mean me. <laughs> and occasionally one of our adjunct staff members uh, very occasionally would come in. We'd pack up art kits and parents were coming the Friday before their child's camp, picking them up and taking them home. And then we were joining them via Zoom for camp. And we have found uh, that uh, if anybody else has led programs for children, it's like you're putting on a, a kid's show. You really have to, it's very high energy. It's very different than um, teaching in person. I know I've reiterated to my colleagues, a lot of my classroom management skills are it's quiet. <laughs> I teach a lot uh, with classroom management with proximity, 
with quiet looks, with things that don't necessarily translate to Zoom. Uh, but we are really lucky that a lot of our educators also teach in K through 12 settings. So they were kind of thrown into it at the end of the school year and had that practice. And then were able to teach with us over the summer. Um, we were also able to do uh, some of our free series that we have that are sponsored, including Unplugged Family Days. Now, it's a little funny, right? The virtual unplugged family day. Uh, our sponsors for that program started working with us to do that program because they wanted families not to be on screens or tablets. And we ended up offering some uh, over virtual Zoom sessions. You can see um, at the bottom, there's a presentation from a wonderful illustrator, Kim Kirkey. And it's a little hard to read, but in the chat, uh, as kids became more comfortable, they're talking about how cute all the animals are, how <laughs> they're talking about all the different kinds of things they see. And we found that they were really excited to be chatting with each other. That was something, having that interaction was really important. Um, an unexpected success for us last year were the adult programs via Zoom. I think a lot of our adults was a little slower of a learning curve to pick up all the skills, but that continues to be a pretty popular program for us, our adult drawing classes. Our instructor had no idea how you know, she wasn't, she, our adult instructor is not in the K through 12 setting. She had to figure out her tablet and her computer and everything to set it up. But we've heard from a lot of our adult students that sometimes they forget to be drawing or painting. They just like watching her draw and paint um, because it's just a way to, for them to connect and share. And um, the, our programs off, uh, varied from free, totally free or pay what you wish up to, um, I think last year people were paying between 90 and $120 for a series of classes. And uh, with a kind of everything in between. Uh, all of our kids' classes included materials because we had just ordered supplies for the spring right before we shut down. So we had a plethora of children's supplies, but we found that it didn't make sense for us to provide materials for, for adults. And so they've been providing all of their own art supplies. And if it's a more casual event, like ladies' night in, um, which is like kind of like a happy hour crafting time. The art supplies are on the lower end because it's uh, casual and we want people to already have the supplies at home. Um, but for adult drawing and painting, they're getting lists of paints and canvas sizes and um, even brushes, depending on the instructor. And uh, Adrian, if you can go to the next slide. In this year, uh, we have been busy. <laughs> Our children's classes have resumed in person, but not anywhere near the full capacity of the classes we've been running. And, uh, but our adults, like I said, they've continued even, with, um, even our adults as they've gotten vaccinated still want to be Zooming from home or from their vacation homes. We've been getting people from Florida and Cape Cod, um, a lot of them have decided to spend their quarantine time somewhere else and they're excited to be able to continue to be a part of our community. Um, I did have a shot there of a little bit of the learning curve. That shot sort of uh, in the very center of the screen is my setup for recording a video for the fall children's classes, I have a document camera on top of some random boxes in our classroom to get it at the height it needed to be. Um, a ring light borrowed from a friend. You can see we're sort of piecemealing our technology here. And because our classroom wasn't in use, it sort of became a storage space. You can even see there's like a stage folded up in the background and it looks very different um, than our regular classrooms. Um, but we have had some really exciting things that we probably wouldn't have been pushed to if we weren't doing virtual already. And one is our Crossing Boundaries program is about 15, 20 years old at this point. But this is the first year we've had 
three high schools collaborate together on a project. Uh, we worked with the Link High School in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, and Central Bucks East High School here in Bucks County. And those students worked together to collaborate on a t-shirt design with a logo around the theme of coming together. And I have a screenshot there of the Padlet. And if you're not familiar with Padlet, it's sort of like a teacher's blog that you can shuffle and arrange in a few different ways. And they were able to comment and chat and like each other's posts. And um, we haven't had this sort of collaboration in the past and we were really excited. That program's just wrapped up. It's in our, um, the resulting t-shirts are up in our gallery space now, but we were just really excited about using this new platform. And I don't think we would have used that platform if we hadn't been pushed during this time. Um, another result that isn't actually uh, virtual is our creators club. And this came as a result of our virtual unplugged family days. <laughs> and those sponsors looking for ways to reach kids in their homes uh, without having to tune into YouTube or a link. And so these are self-contained subscription boxes. We'll be, we just mailed the first one May 1st. And um, the folks that signed up for it are getting a box in July, September, and November. And they have reproductions from our collection as well as all the art supplies that they need for that project. And um, we're still planning for fall. I'm sure just like everybody else, we're looking really closely at what all of the regulation changes are and trying to feel out what our patrons are comfortable with but we have a feeling that we're going to continue virtual adult classes in the fall and um, as an option, and then also having some in-person. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, and so I will turn it over to Melissa. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight and thanks for your interest in the Michener Art Museum. We appreciate you joining us. I am in charge of community programs and group visits, which have changed quite a bit during the pandemic. We've been shifting over to virtual early on. Our first virtual program was April 8th. I also manage the volunteers and docents and we quickly got them engaged in offering these virtual programs to our community. In 2020, we hosted 43 docent-led programs. Uh, the public art of stillness programs were shifted over from a gallery-based program that had been quite popular previous to the pandemic. And we offered 24 of them in 2020, almost weekly. In addition to that, um, I guess I should explain what Art of Stillness programs are all about. Usually we select a single artwork in the gallery. We take some quiet time for slow looking. We introduce some meditation technique and it's all about slowing down and really noticing details in the artwork and then sharing the audience responses to the artwork and building a conversation from that response. When we shifted it to virtual, we added in various components just to keep it lively online. We felt that we could no longer do 30 minutes of silent looking <laughs> in a virtual program. So we had to introduce more information. Uh, so it became more like 15 minutes of silent, uh, quiet looking and guided questioning. And then we added in 15 to 20 minutes PowerPoint background information on the artist and uh, his technique or her uh, training. And then return to the focus of the program to encourage more conversation based on that knowledge of the artist. They've been tremendously popular. We have repeat audience almost every program. And uh, we've built a feeling of community through those programs. And I'll touch more on that later. We also uh, developed virtual docents choice programs open to the public. 
We had been offering those weekly in the galleries on Thursday afternoons. And basically the docent put together a virtual tour through the galleries was uh, presenting four to six artworks. Um, and we presented seven of those. We also created private virtual group programs. These were all customized. We used presentations that we already had in our portfolio that we would take out as slideshows in person to retirement communities, public libraries, civic organizations. We transferred those to the virtual platform, offering them through Zoom. And we presented 12 of those programs in 2020. Total participation in the docent-led programs was uh, 1,236 participants. So we were pretty proud of being able to do that using volunteer docents uh, to present the programs. And so we're very fortunate to have those brave, enthusiastic docents who jumped into the virtual world with us. In 2021, just in the first four months of the year, we've hosted, uh, I should say, I've hosted 22 programs. And uh, again, real focus on the art of stillness virtual programs. We uh, presented 11 of those. We did one public docent's choice, and that was actually an introduction to an exhibition through the lens that was opening this spring. So it was a chance to promote um, what was going on in the galleries and encourage participants in the virtual program to come into the museum when it reopened. And again, we presented 10 private group virtual programs. So we're chugging along here in 2021. We do see as people are becoming fully vaccinated and the weather improves that the participation is diminishing somewhat. I think it will pick up again in the fall. I think we've shown uh, that we can present quality programming for groups that are not quite ready to meet together, whether they're museum going clubs or uh, 55 plus community activity groups. I do believe that they'll be demanding private virtual programs and we will continue to offer public programs in some capacity. Um, and some of the reasons for offering those virtual public programs is to reach a, a broader audience. We had participants from Germany, Sweden, Seattle, Washington, down, down Florida, all over uh, the country. And it really brought in new folks who had never heard of the Michener and were able to become acquainted with our collection. So that was exciting to learn. And we also found that there were people who are not physically able to come into the museum who lived uh, locally who could enjoy the programs and participate. So many reasons to continue. Um, and we've got docents who are capable and willing to continue in the future. Next slide, please. So how to get started. Our public docent-led programs, we, um, I <laughs> was careful to select a variety of artworks to feature. So we uh, presented everything from sculpture to photographs to paintings and mixed up whether it was representational or abstract, um, different techniques that were used just to keep it interesting. Um, content was guided by me and Adrian was heavily involved as well with providing images and uh, some content. But we gave the volunteer docents uh, free reign to do heavy duty research into the artists when they were presenting the PowerPoint segment of the program. And we also uh, began to mix it up and add special features in the programs as we went along. Initially, we were using our Google Arts and Culture images because the um, images were so fabulous. You could zoom in and see details, brush strokes, the canvas texture 
in a way that you could never do in the gallery. And you could have an entire group see those details clearly and carefully. So that was our first start. And we realized that it became awkward shifting over from the Google Arts image to a PowerPoint and then back again. So we eventually just put everything into a PowerPoint and we use the magnifier option in PowerPoint to zoom into details, or we added another photo of details that we wanted to uh, feature. So um, we also featured, as I mentioned before, a special exhibition. So we wanted to highlight artists in our special exhibitions and promote audience um, registration for time tickets to come into the museum when we were open. I did use pairs of docents. This made it more fun for them. They could work as a team, collaborate, uh, bounce ideas off of each other. And it provided me with a backup presenter in case of tech failure at one of the docents' homes, a power outage in one of the docents' homes, or docent illness. So it was a, um, luckily I had enough docents to be able to do that. And the initial docents who participated were fantastic. I did start to notice there was um, burnout because we were offering so many programs. So we started to recruit newer folks to the virtual world and the experienced docents trained the new folks. So we've expanded the pool of docents who are capable of presenting virtual programs and we'll continue to do that. And one of the reasons the docents were willing to dive in was because we told them the staff will manage the technical aspects of running the Zoom program for you. All you have to do is pretend you're giving a normal in-person tour. It's just that you'll be sitting in your home looking at your computer while you do it. So we tried to keep it as simple as possible for them to participate. The private group docent-led programs, uh, we took existing presentations. We would customize the content depending on the group. Sometimes we had special requests for customized uh, content. We had um, one group that wanted to have all winter landscapes from the American Impressionist painters. So we created it and then we used it for other private groups. They loved it. Um, and then later we did one of summertime images. So listening to the customers, figuring out what they really want, making them happy uh, was extremely important, of course. One of the things the private groups enjoyed was that interaction that you can have in a virtual program using the chat feature, unmuting folks, asking them questions, uh, getting them involved in the program. So the private groups, since they already knew each other, liked that social interaction, seeing each other and commenting on each other's comments and, and that kept it fun for them. Uh, we could offer a SQL program. So we have several uh, PowerPoint presentations on the history of women artists in our collection. So if I presented the first one, I would try to promote the group hosting the SQL program. And we always encourage the audience to come into the museum for a gallery visit. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, shows a little bit of the variety of the content. So the image on the right shows you how we all felt in the beginning. Panic mode, how are we going to do this virtual? <laughs> Um, program. We don't know anything about Zoom. We don't have the technology. It was a steep learning curve. But uh, we got into it and we realized the benefits. Um, for example, I remember with that King Lear statue on the right, Adrian happened to be going into the museum and she walked around with her husband, I believe, the entire sculpture and took photos from every angle that we could include in the PowerPoint presentation. So, um, we had to be flexible. We had to think outside the box and come up with new ideas for these programs. On the left, I just wanted to show you that 
I tried to vary the content for the programs depending on what was going on in the world at the time, what was going on in our society. And you can see the date on that, January 14th. We just came through the holidays. There was, there was a spike in COVID cases because of the holidays. People were looking forward, really hoping, hoping that vaccinations were, could start soon. And I wanted to present a program that provided hope. So we reached into our uh, collection and focused on a photographer who is featured in our Through the Lens Photography Special Exhibition. He's also a former colleague, had been on our staff as a chief curator for decades. He's since moved down to South Carolina. We were able to get him in to the program and he was able to speak to the audience, but we showed his series of photographs, absolutely beautiful moving images and everyone just felt a sense of calm at the end of the program. It was extremely moving experience for everyone involved, the docents, for me, uh, for all of the audience. We had an astounding number of participants for that program. So that was really uh, meaningful. And I wanted to show the impact that even virtual programming can have on an audience. At the end of that program, it was just silent. Everyone was absorbing the experience. It was a really beautiful time. Next slide, please. So as, um, as we go through these virtual programs, we really need to take time to listen to the responses and validate the audience responses and then build on those responses, just as we do in import person tours in the galleries to make it as personal as possible. We ended up adding to the art of stillness programs. At the end, we started adding poetry that the docent would read as our final, um, note or final uh, part of the program. And this poem in particular was really moving during the pandemic. And we found that the docents did a fabulous job researching and finding poems perfect for each artwork that we presented, whether it was featuring nature or conversation between friends. And I really loved this sculpture because it was what we were all longing for, a chance to just relax with a friend in a carefree conversation. Uh, no masks, <laughs> warm enough to sit outside just on a summer day. Uh, next slide, please. We featured newly installed permanent collection artwork. So even though the museum was um, partially closed, we were on a reduced gallery opening schedule, the curatorial staff was quite busy changing up what was installed on the walls in addition to presenting uh, special exhibitions. So we wanted to feature newly installed work. This is our buyer's gallery that has been uh, newly installed twice now uh, during the pandemic. And if we featured uh, in that room, we have contemporary and modern art. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the special features of virtual programming is to build appreciation for the collection. If you notice those two teeny tiny paintings in the middle of the photo on the right, those little paintings are often overlooked because they're so small. <laughs> but we were able to feature them in a virtual Art of Stillness program. And that way we could celebrate the, the smallest brush strokes and um, supplement those images with detail photos. Um, so it's a way of bringing to light some pieces that are either in the vault and hardly ever seen or are quite small and visitors just usually pass them by because there are much larger colorful paintings nearby in the galleries. Next slide. Here's an example of supplementary information that we would provide about the artists. For example, Morgan Colt photo 
hear. Um, we would share artists' background information when viewing their work. Uh, we would talk about their influences, their training, travel, family, location. And for example, these buildings pictured here still exist. He designed them way back almost 100 years ago at Phillips Mill, and they still exist in New Hope. So it's important for our audience to know that they can still travel to these locations where our regional painters lived and worked. And next slide. And as I mentioned before, we were able to promote current exhibitions. Uh, Rising Tides was last summer through the lens is uh, currently up. And what we would do is feature one of the artists um, and then show other works from their career or other works in our collection from that artist. And um, I just felt it was very important to promote our exhibitions and make people aware of them and to encourage them to come into the galleries. Next slide. So bottom line, you have to make it memorable. You have to keep it fun and lively. This image on the left, we present in both the adult virtual programs when we featured David Graham's work. And we also used it with some of the school and summer camp group virtual programs. Um, you have to mix it up, throw in the slow looking meditative as aspects, um, poetry, music, video. Adrienne's gotten good at animation, <laughs> which is fun. You saw her little paintbrush earlier. But bottom line, the docents and the staff have to be enthusiastic and really show a lot of energy and love of the arts and share that with the audience. It will make them want to come back for more. We also invited the participants to join the docents for casual conversation after the formal program ended. This helped to build a feeling of community. People would kind of check in with us and I would notice that especially with individuals who were isolated at home, living alone, and they really appreciated us noticing them, asking them how they're doing, um, asking one individual, she finally got vaccinated, she was so excited. And she had joined us for almost every single public program throughout the year. So we got to know her. She was about to leave on a trip to go to Seattle and see her daughter, whom she had not seen for 18 months. So you don't get to know your audience unless you take the time and you make the time at the end of your virtual programs. And they remember how you make them feel. It's important when you're building a membership and uh, dedication to a, a community museum like ours. And you must express appreciation for the audience interest and support throughout. So I want to encourage you all to dive in if you haven't already and uh, think outside the box. It's been quite a journey for us, but I'm very proud of what the docents have accomplished and what our team from the department has accomplished in the past year. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Andrea. Always great to hear and learn um, about all these amazing colleagues that I have at the, the Michener. Hello, my name is Matt uh, Kalaski. I am the manager of public programs at the Michener Art Museum. Uh, so what that means is that I am in charge of events uh, for adults um, at the museum. Uh, just a couple of quick numbers for you. Uh, in 2020, we out offered 30 virtual programs, uh, which included things like music programs, lectures, and workshops. Uh, on average, you know, from the whole year of 2020, programs would have anywhere from two people present to 100 people present. Uh, and in the middle there, I would get really excited if we had 30 people come to a virtual event. Uh, some other numbers, the payment, uh, fees were something that we worked a lot on this through last year and through this year. Uh, we ended up landing on a sliding scale um, that people could pay what they wish, um, depending on what type of program, how much resources went into it. It would either be 
uh, zero, five, or ten dollars. Uh, the most expensive program was ten, fifteen, or twenty dollars. Uh, usually, you know, before the pandemic, uh, in-person events uh, involved our big, beautiful event space. If you've never been to the Michener, we have an amazing uh, event pavilion that's all glass, that lets in the nature and the light and the features of the museum. Uh, we have a really regular audience that comes to these events and comes to these regular uh, calendar events. So in the pandemic, uh, none of those things were really possible. So we had to, um, like everyone else, adapt and shift. Uh, and this is a, you know, my working environment. Eleanor there is always a very steadfast colleague. <laughs> Next slide, please, Adrian. Let's see here. So I'm going to uh, structure my uh, slides around three sort of lessons or parameters that uh, we discovered. And we'll go over some of these uh, later in the presentation too. Um, the first is the lean into Zoom. Uh, early on, it became very clear that a Zoom event was not anything like an in-person event. And so to sort of really divorce yourself from that thinking or trying to compare the two of them and figure out what was unique about this platform and really lean into those qualities uh, to really give people the best possible uh, experience. Some examples here, the choose your own adventure lecture. We use the poll feature of the Zoom uh, where artist Stacy Levy uh, was able to, um, the audience was able to decide what she was gonna talk about, what presentations and answer uh, which questions the audience wanted to. So did they wanna hear what uh, Stacy had for breakfast this morning or what her greatest influence was? They were able to choose that. The demonic looking person up there in the corner, that was a, uh, a talk with uh, Lee Sumter where she was able to uh, talk about 80s sci-fi and post-apocalyptic films through the Zoom vet, something that I don't think we would have been able to do um, in person uh, as effectively as it was online. Um, we, another thing that we were able to do through partnerships was uh, things that we wouldn't be able to do. So for example, we had a number of events in partnership with the Bucks County SPCA. So, you know, in normal times, we would probably not be able to have a goat in the gallery, uh, but during this Zoom pet party, they were able to zoom in. You can see, see the goat friend right there in the center. Uh, and that was a really special and fun event. Our music programs, usually a big hit had to be, uh, these are the, probably the ones that the experience was not translatable to Zoom. So after a lot of consideration and thought, we ended up on a format uh, where we would pre-record these music sets. And during a Zoom event, we would play these pre-recorded sets uh, and intermix them with artist interviews. Um, and this did a lot of really cool things. Um, one, this chance to engage with the artists on a one-on-one -on -one basis was something that we didn't do during our live events. And I think the audience really appreciated this sort of access to the artists. So that was really cool. Another part of these live music events is that each uh, event, one of the songs was uh, recorded within the gallery. So you could see Najwa Parkins here performing um, in front of, in our galleries, in front of these uh, art pieces here, which is something that we would never been able to do um, before. So again, leaning into those really specific uh, qualities of Zoom that we wouldn't be able to do, uh, again, to enhance these, these programs. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, another way we leveraged Zoom here was unexpected partnerships. Um, whether this was, again, like the ACE, the Bucks County SPCA, this wasn't a really cute program that uh, was a pet party where they, uh, this dog was able to do tricks for us. Uh, again, that's a partnership that we wouldn't usually be able to do. Um, we were also able to partner with the Del Valle University in the top right corner there. This is a professor there who is doing a science art class with their kids in the kitchen. Uh, it was like a kitchen art laboratory Zoom program, which was really, really fun. Again, something that we probably wouldn't have been able to do. A partnership that probably would have uh, manifested this way um, if it was in person. Also at the bottom there, you will see Del Val professors gave uh, bi-weekly uh, science talks. We had an exhibition that um, 
focused it on climate and climate issues. So we were able to engage professors. They would talk about their, uh, how their field is um, engaging with climate change. And then we had a docent who would follow the professor and talk about uh, artworks from the exhibition. And then in the center there, it's a little hard to see, but this is one of my favorite partnership programs. Uh, one of the things that we realized is that, you know, with Zoom, there is no real distance limits. So we were able to partner with a museum, uh, the Florence Griswold Museum in Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, this is a great program with Melissa coordinated with both docents from both museums. Um, we did jo a joint project, which was really fun. And I think both of our audiences really enjoyed this collaborative event that would, again, not be possible um, in real life. Next slide, please. And then, you know, with limited resources, we really relied on our staff to um, step up to the plate um, and provide a lot of this content. We asked them to get creative. So, you know, how many times can you do a virtual lecture? Uh, we had a really amazing exhibition of, of this surrealist work that had a lot to do with the apocalypse and post-apocalyptic imagery. So one of the ways we structured one of the talks are at for this exhibition was a, a curator go bag challenge, which just basically meant we, I asked the curators to pick which of these paintings in the exhibition they would put into a go bag, which is, if you don't know, a bag that you would grab on your way out if you were facing a sort of detrimental life experience. So they were able to structure their um, lecture around this, this theme, which made it, again, uh, interesting and more um, engaging for our audiences. The, the bottom image was a event we did for our members. So these events that we utilized with our staff, uh, we utilized them to, uh, for a free members events. Again, to incentivize people being members of the museum, they got access to these exclusive events, one of which was a Tales from the Vault which was, you know, the vault of our museum is usually a place that you're not allowed to go or even have access to. But during this virtual Zoom event, our preparator, Nick Teddy, uh, was able to showcase one of his favorite art pieces in the museum, this sculptural chair here. Um, and that was a really special moment uh, because, again, they wouldn't have normally have access to that, um, uh, to that art piece. And then lastly, we did another program with our staff um, that was focusing on the uh, scrapbooks of artist Fern Coppage. Uh, and this was mostly because the museum has just uh, digitized these uh, scrapbooks of the artists and were recently made online. So we focused a program around these uh, clippings and images, uh, again, that you wouldn't normally have access to uh, if it wasn't for this uh, digital program. Um, and last thing I'll say, you know, about these events to help keep costs low, what we would do is we would bundle them around a specific theme. So we had a art and food day with four or five virtual events. We had a pet and art day around virtual events. We had a uh, Earth Day virtual art day. Again, so that we would bundle these virtual events so that we essentially could advertise them as one unit instead of six different events. Uh, and that really helped us reach our audiences uh, and gain traction for these virtual events. All right, I think I have talked more than enough. Uh, I wanna turn it back over for these last couple of slides here. I know we're almost running out of time. All right, thanks, Matt. And thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Andrea. It's back, I'll, I'll uh, wrap us up here. But um, so um, if anyone has any questions, please do share them in the chat. We wanted to just summarize a couple things. Clearly you've learned a lot about um, some of the benefits um, and also the challenges that we've all learned through this year and a half of virtual programming. And, you know, the partnerships, um, as Matt just mentioned, I still wanted to adopt that goat <laughs> from the pet, pet event. But honestly, we've, you know, and I wanna open it up also here to my colleagues to share any other additional thoughts for benefits. Um, 
you know, we, we might not want to admit it, but I think, you know, we, as we kind of plunged headfirst into the, into this virtual world, not knowing much, we've learned a lot of skills and I, those skills are really, really valuable. And I think the team, I think we were all able to think creatively and we were experimental, even though there were all these challenges that we were facing throughout the year, it's, it just, it forced us to sort of think outside the box. And I think we were successful in many different ways. And I, I'm so proud to be um, uh, working with all of my colleagues in the department. Um, and, you know, we uh, working up close with artworks and getting super detailed, you know, getting to look at objects that are not normally on view in the museum. That was something, another benefit. Um, so these are just some of the, the other uh, benefits that, that we, we encountered. And, and I think we were successful in keeping our communities engaged. Any other thoughts, Melissa, Andrea, Matt, um, for this? No, all right. Yeah, and that the pay with what you wish model, I think that was um, that was I think a successful successful outcome from all of these all of these programs. I'll I'll move on to our next slide, um, our challenges slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I think too, you know, as I mentioned, the the being flexible with the pandemic with the constant changes in in cdc requirements and the government updates and the local updates and the safety guidelines you know everybody was nimble and flexible and i think the magic word we always use was pivot we were pivoting <laughs> i think that was the most you know uh, we use that a lot during the year but and then you know balancing what would be free and what would be paid how much would have would a would a program cost and also the value i think you know the the it, obviously there's so much content and programming out there um, with a lot of organizations and there is um a, you know what is that perceived value from our from visitors you know the expectations of well should this be free or how much if it's pay, paid how much should it cost um, we were definitely also working with no budget um, you know, and very, very limited resources. We did um, have staff cutbacks and staff layoffs in the summertime. So we did um, definitely have some challenges as far as resources um, and time um, in implementing a lot of these programs. Um, we, we don't have an IT department on site. Um, so that's something that we all really took the time to teach ourselves a lot of the technology that was utilized. And you know the time to create the programs. I think acknowledging that is is enormous because, as we had talked about a lot, you know, prepping for an in person program might take, let's say, an hour, where you know you have a virtual program that might take two two hours or two and a half hours for preparation. And the time and energy and and um, work that went into um, putting these virtual programs together is definitely something to to recognize and fatigue. I think not only with our visitors, but with ourselves and acknowledging that, you know, we were also working in a virtual environment and learning those new workflows and learning those new communication processes and not being in person. So that was, I think, acknowledging that um, and then coming out, you know, here we are in, in May of 2021 and we've made it through, but, um, and I think we're, we're still certainly learning. Any other thoughts from any of you? No? All right. We were also Zoom support, IT support. <laughs> <laughs> visitors would be asking us, I didn't get the link, or we can't do this. <laughs> um, and then, so finally, um, so for our future, um, I think as what we've mentioned, we're continuing to learn, I think continuing to all, we all think that, and all believe that virtual will stay with us um, as to what level, we're still figuring that out. 
Um, you know, we've, we do know that we've gained a lot of benefits um, when working with, with access to audiences that we've never seen before, uh, you know, internationally and across the country. So we know that, you know, virtual is, is a, continues to be definitely something for accessibility purposes um, and possibly exploring hybrid models of programs, whether these are both an in-person program and a streaming event. That's something to still talk about. Um, and so we're just, I think we're all eager to see what the rest of the year brings and, um, and hopefully uh, we'll see where we are in the fall. Are there any other questions maybe in the chat? Let's see. Ah, Catherine, has there been anything particularly surprising, unexpected in the implementation of these programs? That's a great question. Does anybody, any of uh, Matt, Melissa, or Andrea, you want to share anything? I think it was tricky, especially in the beginning. On March 13th, we were told to pack up and head home. And we thought we were going home for a couple of weeks, maybe. And here we are more than a year later, still working primarily from home. And uh, when we last March and April, when we were saying, how do we provide programming virtually? It was the blind leading the blind. We started attending those QZM seminars. Do you remember, Adrian? Yeah. yeah. Um, they were actually very helpful. And, you know, the, the Zoom tutorials and we had nobody in house with experience to teach us these skills so we had to learn as we went along um, and adapt and really take what worked well and build on it and quickly discard what didn't work i i had been offering art for all programs for people with dementia in the galleries for years and they were really an important part of our outreach programming. And I tried it with docents in a virtual platform, but at that point, um, the residents of the me memory care facility had not been vaccinated yet. So they brought together a small group of socially distanced elders into an activity room, tried to show them the program on a large screen TV, but they were so spaced back from the large screen TV, they couldn't hear because a lot of elders have difficulty hearing. So it was one, it really was very difficult. And we quickly learned that the virtual platform was creating yet another barrier for that audience. And we didn't, we didn't try it again. We look forward to interacting with um, that audience in person as soon as we can and I think they're eager to get back out now that the residents are fully vaccinated but we we had to experiment we had to try things um, I remember we we've had dozens lose their um, zoom in the middle of a program their you know face would freeze up we had I was trying to start up a program recently the docent was borrowing her husband's computer and didn't know how to get the audio going so I'm seeing the husband peeking around the door behind her because he had just disrobed to take a shower. And he's trying to give her instruction without exposing himself to the rest of us. So you have these crazy situations where you're troubleshooting last minute before a program's supposed to start. And finally, it all comes together. And, and the audience has no idea what's been going on behind the scenes to make it happen. We try to stay professional in our presentations, but you just have to be extremely uh, flexible. Yes. Thanks, Melissa. That's great. Um, oh, um, the national international audiences. I see Museum Council, um, Allison. Um, did you target them directly or did that happen organically? Actually, it happened organically. Um, mm -hmm. Melissa, and that was with your, your programmatic um, right. It, it was organic. Uh, one of our docents had a friend she went to grad school with. This docent was helping me with the virtual programs. She had a friend who lived in Sweden. So we did a private group program for the Gothenburg um, 
International Women's Club. And that was pretty early on. I think it was last June. Uh, and it went very well. We customized it. We included some artists from Sweden in our program. We did a little quick research to add them into our presentation on the New Hope Art Colony um, to relate it to what they were familiar with in their local museum. So that was organic. And then when we did the program on Gwen Kerber more recently, she is an artist from this region, but she currently lives in Germany. And she joined us from Germany uh, with some friends over there for the program. And she was able to contribute quite a bit uh, to the program. So that was pretty astounding, a special opportunity there. Yeah. Great, thank you. If anyone has any questions, please include them in the chat. Otherwise, I know we ran a little over time this evening. Um, Andrea or Matt, do you have any other parting words as well for tonight? I think we've said it uh, pretty well. And I, the biggest thing for us was just really being flexible and listening to our audiences. We, way, we've always listened to audiences, but I think uh, they've they're so comfortable contacting us via email and everything now and giving us feedback and really just uh it's so much energy that has to go into planning and prepping for everything that allowing them to tell you what they're interested in has been really helpful for us yeah and i will say the to touch on the most surprising and unexpected thing i think really figuring out what how to how, figuring out what to charge for these programs was really challenging just because there was such a deflated um, valuing of online programming. So how did you make this worth something that uh, people would support and spend money on? That took us a really long time to figure out. And to, I mean, not saying that we uh, solved it, but I think that was probably the biggest challenge was um, how do you provide a product for people or a experience for people that um, they wanted to contribute with. And so figuring out all those unique ways to engage them, providing the things that they wanted to or comfortable seeing um, was really challenging. And you know that was harder than anything I think I've done as a museum professional in a long time. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Matt. Well, I want to thank um, Museum Council um, and thank you to all um, all my colleagues tonight. Um, and if you do want to reach out to us, this is our these are our email addresses. Please don't please don't hesitate. You can reach out to us anytime. Um, thanks again for joining us tonight. Thank you guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.